All right, let's pick up where we left off last time. Uh, I want to study for a minute together the mind, and you've already had some of this with the doctor, but uh, we're going to take it a little bit different uh, avenue than, than he sure. does, uh, a little bit step farther. Um, let's go ahead and put up on the screen the picture of the brain, and uh, right. look at a couple things, because your brain's capacity is, is unbelievable. Uh, and they're going to put the, uh, this slide up. Your brain can actually process 30 billion bits of information per second. Your brain is the equivalent of 6,000 miles of wiring, Real. literally in it. And it houses 28 billion neurons, which communicate with each other over 100,000 miles of nerve fibers, okay? Now, these neurons that we're talking about here, what these simply are, these are nerve cells that conduct impulses in your brain. And without your, uh, these neurons, your brain would not be able to interpret the information that comes to you through your five senses, your taste, touch, smell, hearing, sight, and so on. Mm -hmm. Each one of these neurons is a tiny self-contained computer, and you've got 28 billion of them, all right? Let's go to the next slide on the screen mm -hmm. and read a little bit more here. It says you have 20, about 28 billion neurons, nerve cells that conduct impulses. Each one can process over a million bits of information. So of the 28 billion neurons, each one itself can do a million bits of information. You've got over 100,000 miles of nerve fibers in your brain. And information from one single neuron can actually travel to over 700,000 of the neurons in less than 20 milliseconds. And so unlike our step-by-step our -step computers today, your brain can literally take uh, anything, any problem, anything you're dealing with, and uh, it can work on these things all at the same time with all these 28 billion neurons. It's, it's just an incredible setup that God has given us. And uh, here's the, the problem we have then. Most of us try to work our way into changing our behavior. And we work at it, and we try to change, and we give it all we got, and we, get, you know, we fail, we get discouraged, and so on. When we have to realize the truth is God has designed us in a way that our behavior is actually rooted in our nervous system, in the form of these neural pathways or neural connections, as they're called in medical science today. Uh, Ellen G. White, by the way, and I've got to throw this in here right now. Uh, you know, she's such a blessing, and, and, and um, the more I read her, the more I realize she had to be inspired of God. Um, and there's a couple quotes on this. You've got to realize she writes this stuff back in the 1800s. Right. And medical science, what she, you know, what God revealed up there in the 1800s, Medical science has, has figured this out in the last 20 years. It's, it's amazing. Mm. And uh, one of the first quotes I like is on page 60 out of her book, Mind, Character, and Personality. Great book. It says, the influence of the mind and the body, as well as of the body and the mind, should be emphasized. The electric power of the brain, prompted by mental activity, vitalizes the whole system. She talked about the electrical power of the brain. Literally, your brain is wired, literally like a computer. And, and most people don't realize, literally, it is that way. She goes on to say on page 72, the brain is the capital of the body. It's the seat of all the nervous forces and of mental action. The nerves proceeding from the brain control the body. By the brain nerves, mental impressions are conveyed to all the nerves of the body as by telegraph wires, and they control the vital action of every part of the system. All the organs of motion are governed by the communications they receive from the brain. All right, so these neural pathways control, she says, everything that has to do with your physical Ellen body. Ellen wrote that. Back in I'm a knowledge back nah, then. Nah, I, wouldn't have, that. I wouldn't have thought so. Medical science has literally discovered this in, tw in the last 20 years. Hmm. But it's just another proof of her inspiration, because this, yeah. this is amazing stuff. Incredible. And uh, so anyway, let, let's take a, 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 a look at it here. Uh, as medical science has discovered these, these electrical impulses, these hundreds of thousands of miles of wiring that, that's actually in our mind, this is what enables people to be able to jump from one thing to another. In other words, if I would say to our audience, can, can you smell a rose? Everybody can smell a rose, right? And this, you have a neural pathway that a rose smells like, okay? Mm -hmm. um, in fact, let's go to the next slide. You're going you're gonna to see an area here on the next slide. This is your brain magnified 15,000 times, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, let's go ahead and throw a little circle in there in the bottom right corner. And you'll notice there that uh, you have these little cobweb little strands. What you're literally looking at physical neural pathways. They are there. And, and I want to point this out because it's so important. It's like a fingernail. It, it, it's like a hair follicle. These things are physically there. So when I just gave the example of, of what does a rose <coughs> smells like, well, that little mm -hmm. place you see in their circle, that little strand, yes. that is what a rose smells like. It's recorded in your brain in that physical neural pathway. Mm. All right? If I would say to you the taste of chocolate, like we have this cake here, all right? Yes. Everybody in our audience can tell what chocolate tastes like. Well, again, if you look at that little circle there on the screen, uh, one of those little neural pathways there tells you what chocolate tastes like, okay? okay. A song in your mind, like the song you just heard him sing. Mm -hmm. uh, that is recorded now in your mind in a physical neural pathway. It's there, yeah. physically there. Wow. Everything you've tasted, everything you've touched, everything you've seen, everything you've smelled, everything you've heard, everything you've experienced in your life is recorded in this brain in the form of a physical neural pathway. It's there and it's there forever. Now mm. think about the power of that. It's incredible. Yes, it is. 
When people realize this for the first time, that everything I've seen, tasted, touched, smelled, everything that's coming to my five senses is recorded in this brain in the form of a neural pathway, then something else dawns on us, and that is, it's almost scary. My behavior is actually rooted in my nervous system. Mm. When I lose my temper, that's because it's rooted in my nervous system. When I'm happy, it's in my nervous system. Anything I experience in life is, is in my nervous system. And, and what happens is this, ocean or feeling or thing, that narrow, little thin neural pathway is traced there in your brain, and they found something else interesting in medical science today. Anytime you reaccess that behavior, that thought, that feeling, that emotion, or whatever it may be, every time you reaccess it, guess what it does? It adds another strand mm. to that same neural pathway. Oh, have mercy. You repeat the behavior again, it adds another strand. You hear the word again, it adds another strand. Every time you repeat it, it adds another strand to that neural pathway until that physical neural co connection gets stronger and stronger. All right, let's go to the next slide in the upper left-hand corner, and you're going to see something else very, very interesting here. Uh, as they point out in the left-hand corner there, you'll see that white mass. Look at that white mass up there. What yes. you've got there is thousands and thousands and thousands of these neural strands all bound together. All right? Mm -hmm. This person, let's say that, that this person has a problem with his temper and he loses his temper yes. all the time. All right, every time he loses his temper, he adds another strand. He loses his temper the next day, he adds another strand. Then let's That's say he terrible. watches a TV program, and in the TV program, the people are mad and losing their tempers. It adds another strand up there. All right, let's say he reads a book, and in the book, people are losing their tempers. Well, it adds another strand if he thinks that way. He's on the job. He sees people get mad on the job and lose their temper, adds another strand. Every time he sees it, experiences mm -hmm. it, hears it, it adds another strand. <clears throat> And so it's your literature right now, you're seeing that mass together. Neuro and when wow. people say, I can't help, I can't seem to help myself. You know what? I can't. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why. So now you can brain. Mm. And, and it's there and it's there forever. And so the more out of, uh, pattern mm. of behavior, uh, likely that your behavior becomes. Uh, the more you strengthen it by repetition, the stronger people have cables in their brains to certain behaviors like depression. Mm. And they just Little 101 on the brain, the frontal lobe, very important area of the brain. This is where we experience spirituality, morality, and the will, reason and conscience, judgment and decision making, prayer and worship, discerning spiritual truth. All these things take place in this very important area of the brain, but not just that, also empathy, being, having compassion for others, and altruistic love of others, and get putting their needs above your own. Now you know, based on that list, this is a super important area of the brain to have strong, healthy, functioning. Well, the Bible actually told us about the frontal lobe long ago. Isaiah tells us, come let us reason together, says the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control, and love your neighbor as yourself. All of these are frontal lobe activities. Altruism, self-control, reason. They were all there in the Bible all along. Now there's another area of the brain that's not talked about as much as the frontal lobe that I want to mention just briefly and that's called the limbic system. It's often the, the competitor of the frontal lobe. It's, off, it's often the, the opponent of the frontal lobe. The limbic system is known as the lizard brain by evolutionary psychologists. Now I don't believe that we evolved from lizards but I do believe and, and the science shows that these are where our more animalistic tendencies, our more base passions are rooted out of that limbic system in the, in the lower midbrain. The fight or flight mechanism, in other words, fear or aggression, those are limbic system impulses. The appetite for food or for sex, so you've got your lust there, your desire for fleshly things, that's also coming out of the limbic system circuits. How about this list? Fear, stress, lust, impulses, worry, anxiety, anger, irritability, negativity, and aggression. Now, I don't know a lot of people that want all of those things in control in their lives. I don't know a lot of people that say, yes, I want that limbic system strong and, and governing and dominating my psyche and my, my choices and thoughts. Not at all. We want this thing tamed. Now, by the way, the limbic system is part of the brain. God gave us a limbic system. We're supposed to, Eve was supposed to have a fear impulse when she walked over to that tree, right? But then you elevate that fear, that limbic system impulse to the higher reasoning powers of the frontal lobe and you evaluate it. You have, have sound judgment and self-control. So here she's using her frontal lobe. But the limbic system was sort of that red flag that alerted her to it. So don't think that I'm saying the limbic system is bad. But these things must be in their proper balance. 
The Bible also talked about the limbic system. Their God is their stomach, says Philippians 3.19. The desires of the flesh are the sinful nature, Paul, ta- Paul refers to. This is coming out of the limbic system again. To be carnally minded is death. The carnal mind is enmity against God. There's that carnal nature, that fleshly nature that we're talking about. Now you might say, what does this have to do with television? What does this have to do with media, video gaming, etc.? I want you to imagine like you have a switch on the front of your brain, on your forehead. And you sit down to view theatrical style entertainment television. And I said it that way on purpose. Not a documentary, not a DVD on media, not a sermon. Theatrical style entertainment television does this. Literally just turns off your frontal lobe. It's totally subdued while you're watching this entertainment. Now, I I should illustrate this because this this was a big thing for my wife and I when we were watching TV and we were we were we were living worldly. What what we would do is she, she would she would sit here like this, especially during the ads, and she'd get this kind of look on her face, right? You know what I'm talking about. What's happening in the brain there actually is because of the the rapid frame of reference change in the style of of, of advertising and theatrical style entertainment. It's lulling the brain into a, what's called an alpha pattern. This is a brainwave frequency that's slower. Basically, I get into all of that in the seminar in great detail. But for now, just know that this is sort of a uh, highly suggestible state. It's it's a, a, a hypnotic state actually. Now, when you're listening to me right now and you're thinking about what I'm saying, you're in a higher frequency brainwave called beta. This is the critical thinking, moral filter is up, but when you're down in this alpha trance, that moral filter comes down and you're just kind of zoned out like this. And, and now you might think, well, what, it, what does he mean, rapid frame, frame of reference? Imagine the show, the guy gets out of the car, right? The show is going, and then there's a camera that shows him close the door. Then there's a camera that shows him walk up to the door. Then a different frame shows, shows the, the hand knocking on the door. Then one camera angle shows the guy coming to the door. Then the dialogue begins, very rapid dialogue, two seconds, three seconds. The average frame of reference change in theatrical style entertainment takes place every three seconds. So it's jarring the brain and lulling the brain into this unnatural thing. Now, in a, in a, in a multi-camera shoot like this, you'll see the frame of reference change. You'll see the slide come up, but it's not as rapid. When you're watching a documentary, there's a guy talking, and it actually takes him 12 seconds to get a thought out. Not, you can't uh, express an idea in less than three seconds. So they hold the, the whole image on, on the guy they're interviewing, for example. So it's only this style of entertainment, but this is what's happening. And actually... Dr. Akio Mori at Nihon University in Japan studied the same thing when they're playing video games. He, he, he hooked up a monitor, looked at brainwave activity, and it was the same thing, but even stronger with video games, lulling down into this sort of alpha trance. Now, I should mention, I, I, I use the word hypnotic. All of this entertainment is, it has this hypnotic effect, but there's a hypnotist out there named Mark J. Ryan. I cover him in the, in the seminar. There's a whole video interview of him where he's talking about how the movies, Hollywood is actually going beyond the simple rapid frame of reference change thing, and they're deliberately entering into the subconscious of the masses through the films that they're making. And it, it almost sounds crazy coming out of my mouth. Like, I, I don't want to say it, but it's just reality. It's, 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 he had, he, he's an expert in his field. He knows what's happening in Hollywood, and he does a tell-all on one film, and then he says, all Hollywood studios are using these methods. You've got to see the clip, but we don't have time to cover it tonight. But just as uh, when my wife and I were sitting here doing this, she'd be, like I said, totally zoned out like this, right? And I knew at the time, I wasn't, I wasn't following the Lord's convictions to move away from this entertainment, but I knew what was happening to the mind. And, and so I'd look away from the screen during the commercials. I knew that they were manipulating me. And I'd say, hey, honey, what do you want to have for supper? And one time, literally, I, I asked her a question while the commercials were running. She was in this, this uh, hypnotic, highly suggestible state, and this was her answer. She didn't even hear me. Nobody's home there. At the commercial end, and she goes, did you say something a minute ago? But this is what's happening in the brain. Literally, the frontal lobe is turned off, but at the same time, the frontal lobe obviously almost completely shuts down, as we said. But theatrical-style entertainment television is also designed to produce a limbic 
impulse of some kind. If you think about the different kinds of entertainment that are out there, they're designed to get you to, to feel angry or fearful or aggression or maybe lust or, or sadness or, or just general amusement where you're not supposed to think about it, I've been told. You're supposed to turn your frontal lobe off, let the filmmaker lead you into this limbic experience of feeling, and that's how it's designed to be. Even, even harmless cartoons, just amusement, just silly, right? But it has neurological consequences. If you think about this, you've got your frontal lobe and your limbic system, right? Imagine that I've got a weight system and I get up every morning and I, and I, I, I lift weights with, with one arm like this over and over and over and over again. And I leave the other arm in a sling day in and day out. What's going to happen? One arm is going to get very strong and the other emaciated and weak. This is what happens in our brains. They're finding actually that people that are raised with television have overactive limbic systems, underactive frontal lobes, exactly the same as children who grew up in abusive households. This is a brain damaging thing and it's a form of abuse. That's why France has said it's illegal. You can't air this stuff to children aimed at under three because their, their, their brains are especially vulnerable to this kind of thing. But if it can affect the three-year-old brain, by the way, it can affect the adult brain because the latest research on the brain has discovered the immense plasticity of the brain. It's changeable, it's malleable. Hours and hours of television is literally child abuse, powerful information. And gaming is the same thing. With video gaming, they just did a study where they looked at the brains uh, uh, under a scan while doing various activities, the brains of some young people, and then they had them play video games for one week. Only 10 hours. That's a little over an hour a day. So only 10 hours for a week, not 40 hours a week, only 10. And they found at the end of the week that those, those, their, their brains operated differently now. After only one week, they had lower prefrontal cortex function. That's the most important area of the frontal lobe. It was already weakened and damaged by just playing video games for a week. You know, the Bible says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God wants to heal our minds. He wants to transform us to be like him, but we're doing the opposite in our culture today. We are conforming ourselves to the way the world does it, and there are consequences for mind and character. Because what's happening up here, my thoughts and my feelings form my moral character. Well, this has, I haven't even said anything about the moral content of the programming, have I? When, when you think about the hundreds of thousands of acts of violence and sexual things that we're subjecting ourselves to, it takes it to a whole new level of scary, and we get all that in, into all that in the full seminar, but right now I just want to give you an anecdotal story. There was an Amish kid, obviously didn't grow up with television, but he left the Amish community. He watched his first television show. It was a movie. It happened to be an old Western, and he sat down to watch the Western film, and somebody got shot in the film. When the, when the shooting happened, like they did in the old westerns, he, he turned white as a ghost. He ran out of the house and he threw up. And we think, well, that's a, that's a weird response to that. I mean, I watch that stuff and it doesn't affect me. No, 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 he's not the weird one. We're the weird ones because we've become so desensitized to it. I wish I could talk more about that, but more on that in the full seminar. You see, when the brain sees these things, Steven Pinker, a psychologist, tells us that the visual system never learns that television is just a pane of glowing phosphor dots and that the person never loses the illusion that there is a world behind the pain. In other words, what you see with your eyes is reality to your brain. Your, brain does, your visual system doesn't know how to discern between reality and fiction. So when we're viewing these things, it is like our reality to us. It's not just entertainment. Now, do you want some good news? How about some good news about the brain? Newberg and Waldman did a study where they had subjects of the study contemplate a God of love for 12 minutes a day, every day, for 30 days. At the end of the study, they found that the area of the frontal lobe associated with empathy and altruism grew measurably. So we know, we know that studying our Bibles is going to be beneficial to us, but now the science confirms it. You will be a more loving and compassionate person. The anterior cingulate cortex of the frontal lobe will grow measurably. And you'll become the more, more Christ-like the more you are thinking about God's character. By beholding, we become changed. And we're beholding the things of this world. I wonder what we're being changed into there. But there's a couple of books that have done a really good job collecting a lot of the studies that have been done. There have been thousands of studies done on the effects of television on, on, on various aspects of human society and physiology. Don't expect to hear these studies reported on TV, but they've done a good job in plug-in drug and remotely, remotely controlled collecting all these. And so I'll, I'm just going to list a few. First thing, 
Television viewing is a major cause of depression. All of these have studies backing them up. Decreases academic achievement. Inhibits speech development. Decreases reading comprehension. Increases the likelihood of children developing ADHD. Decreases creativity and imagination. And that one's especially interesting to me because I had a well-meaning loved one share with my wife and I, and, and we're not mad at this person, but they said, you know, your little one Levi, he really should be watching some TV because if he doesn't, he won't develop creativity and an imagination. And I'm going, no, the studies show the opposite, that when you're in this passive mode, your brain is not active and imaginative and creative. It's going to actually numb those capabilities. TV viewing decreases the ability to succeed, causes vision problems, makes you less likely to exercise, causes emotional problems, including in some cases PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And in the 1980s, this is an interesting one, households that acquired cable TV earliest saw spikes in, in, in autism. So in the ongoing debate about what's causing autism, this could be a factor. Moving on. TV makes you eat more, makes you crave sugary foods, causes obesity, increases children's chances of becoming alcoholics later in life. And I wonder if this, this is because we're seeing so many alcohol commercials. Or actually, if you're not watching the commercials, they're still advertising to you constantly in the shows. It's called a product placement where the guy picks up his drink and drinks it and it tells you the brand of it right there. And you were just advertised to 316,000 plus times in 2009 alone just during prime time. There were alcohol products product placement. Hundreds of thousands of times in one year alone just during prime time. Moving on with some other statistics. TV viewing makes you feel less, less in love with your partner. TV viewing makes women feel less deserving of being loved makes families spend less time together, increases the divorce rate, increases negative moods, increases copycat suicides, lowers self-esteem and confidence, increases the desire for cosmetic surgical procedures. Even in the news, this is an interesting one, they did a study where they had people view 14 minutes of negative news per day. Just 14 minutes, negative news per day. It increased uh, anxiety, it increased stress hormones that impair your memory, it increased sad mood, it increased personal catastrophization like terrible things are happening in my life, worrisome thoughts, and so on, all went up. Moving on with some more. TV viewing reduces athletic performance, uh, actually increases Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Friedman was the one that discovered this, and he said that the reason this is happening is because you're in this passive, semi-conscious state while watching normal television programming, and that's, the mind is not active, so it's not being exercised. So the more television you watch from age 20 to age 60, the greater likelihood for Alzheimer's disease. Continuing on. TV viewing stresses the body. TV viewing causes sleep deprivation. It has doubled the murder rate in Western societies. I got to pause on this one for just a second because you might say, what? How is that possible? Well, some researchers, Centerwall and his colleagues, did a study where they, they noticed a spike in the murder rate in the United States and in Canada. Two different societies with very different gun control laws, demographic factors, socioeconomic factors, but they both, within 15 years of the entrance of television into society, they both experienced a doubling in the homicide side rate. And this made them go, oh, what, 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 what possible correlating factors are there here that might cause this? And television was the only one they could find. Well, so they looked at South Africa. South Africa got television later, 1970s. And as soon after the entrance of television, they hypothesized that South Africa would also experience a doubling in the murder rate, same time period, 15 years from when television came in. And they looked at white on white crime only, not, not the apartheid violence that was happening. And guess what happened? Just as they predicted, a doubling in the murder rate in South Africa. And they said, we can conclude nothing else other than television caused this. But what were we watching back in the 1950s? We were not watching Terminator. We were watching Leave it to Beaver and Lassie. How did Leave it to Beaver and Lassie cause the murder rate to double, Dr. Centerwall? Well, here's the answer. Imagine that I've got a spectrum here. On one end, we've got self-control. And on the other end, and you've got impulsive behavior. Now everybody, based upon their genetics and their child rearing and their life choices that they make, finds themselves somewhere on this spectrum. Maybe more self-control, maybe more impulsive behavior. Well, what television does is it sends everybody one notch over. Because you remember the frontal lobe gets weakened, limbic system gets enhanced, everybody moves one notch over. So you imagine if you would have otherwise had a very self-controlled situation driving down the road, a guy cuts you off. You just pray for him, smile, and move on. You've moved one notch over and you kind of grit your teeth and grip the steering wheel. Now, if you would have done that, television has damaged and retrained your brain to be more impulsive in your behavior, more aggressive, and now you step on the gas and glare at him. 
If you would have done that, you step on the glass, glare at him, and honk the horn. If you would have done that, you're, you're, you're screaming at him, you're, you're giving hand gestures, etc. Now the person who is right on the edge of the abyss, ready to, just close to committing murder, they're the ones that are put, pushed over the edge and they actually pull out the gun and shoot the guy. It's just an illustration to show that no, TV doesn't make everybody go out and kill. But what it does is it moves everybody over on the spectrum. And I don't want to be going this direction. I'm not afraid of being a murderer, but I am afraid of having less self-control in my life. I want to have, I want to go in this direction. That's what the Lord wants for each of us as well. Moving on with some more studies. It stunts, television viewing stunts the development of children's brains, damages the brains of both children and adults, and decreases your lifespan. This is an interesting one. Have you heard about how they study cigarette smoking? And they can actually look at the lifespan of a smoker, count how many cigarettes he smoked during his life, and they can average out how many minutes each cigarette took off his life because the average uh, smoker's lifespan is shorter than the average lifespan. So if he wasn't a smoker, you know, they can just do the math. They've found that the average cigarette takes 11 minutes off your life for every time you smoke a cigarette, 11 more minutes off your life. Now, they've done the same thing with television, except it's twice as bad. Look at the slide. An average of 22 minutes is taken off your life for every hour of TV you watch. Now, we make strong statements about non-smoking, but an hour of television is twice as bad for your health in terms of le- measured on a lifespan issue. Twice as bad. Wow. 